Mark 15, and we'll start with verse 27. I'm sorry, 27. Doug knew what I was talking about. <laughs> All right. Um, this is Jesus on the cross, and what we are going to read here is in line with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he begins to talk about the cross being foolishness and weakness. Um, and yet God calls it wisdom and power, but he's talking about that very, the weakness of God is stronger than men. And the wisdom of the cross is wiser than men. The wisdom of God in the cross, and that's what he's referring to. And so in Mark <clears throat> chapter 15, starting at verse 27, and with him, with Jesus, they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He was counted as one of them. He was counted as a criminal. Um, verse 29, and they that passed by railed at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. Verse 30, Save thyself and come down from the cross. <clears throat> so also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Then verse 31, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. All right. <clears throat> Probably the most powerful, one of the most powerful descriptions of the nature of God is right, written right here. The shame of it is that it is said by people who have no clue what they're saying. And that is found in verse 31. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. <clears throat> Here we have an example of the weakness of God. <clears throat> First of all, it just has to be understood that if you are about the business of saving others, you don't have time to save yourself. If you are about the business of saving yourself, you don't have time to save others. You will sacrifice others to save yourself. <clears throat> And that's the wisdom of this world. We're going to deal with that further in one of the other classes. But that's, that's folks, that just makes common sense with the wisdom of this world. If you're going to save yourself, you may have to sacrifice others. If you're going to save yourself, you might have to break a few eggs to get an omelet. You know, and all sorts of dumb sayings that we use to justify selfishness so that others or sacrificed to our cause. <clears throat> and so, um, it is just a fact that Jesus saved others, but himself he cannot save. He can't do it because of the weakness of God. God will have to raise him from the dead. He, the scriptures never really declare in that sense that he raised, he rose from the dead. Many of our little uh, things that we quote, you know, I was raised in the United Methodist Church and we quote the Apostles' Creed and, it, and on the third day he arose from the dead. But in truth, 
It's impossible. He didn't. He didn't. He was raised from the dead by the Father. He was raised by God. <clears throat> and so, um, well, let me just give you a definition of weakness here. Definition, to be willing to be seen as less or unimportant because you put others first and do not fight for your own rights. And then I wrote, if you struggle with this, don't do it. <laughs> and I say, we, um, you put others first and you do not fight for your own rights or status. And this is a huge thing in Philippians 2. The status thing is just as big as rights or um, uh, privileges however you want to look at that, because usually rights are something that we feel, you know, they're due us, but, but privileges a lot of times are due to our status, so status is very important to people. <laughs> reputation, he made himself of no reputation. That's the way it was actually translated in the King James, was not that he emptied himself, but he made himself of no reputation. Literally, he was willing and here's what you have to do. He emptied himself of all things godly that would give him reputation based on divinity and not based on nature. We talked about this some years back on um, kenosis where we talked about the uh, difference between the two uh, that which is by nature, and uh, anybody remember the wordings I used? <clears throat> I'm sorry, what? Yeah, yeah, official glory and the glory of nature. <clears throat> and so he gave up his official glory and the divinity that would, would give him that glory. And he appeared as a man, and he appeared as a servant, and he washed his disciples' feet, and he, you know, I, he said, I came not to minister or to be ministered unto, because if he did, he would have come in his official glory, but to minister and to give my life a ransom, you know. And um, so... Um, Let me just read here. It is a glimpse into the true nature of God to find one who, when faced with the choice of saving himself or others, he chooses others. We know that Jesus could have called 10,000 angels in order to save himself. This signifies that the Lord had the means and the power, and that's important, folks. That is not just words, but surely we just speak words, and it's hard to digest everything. <clears throat> but it is... It is uh, uh, it is this reality that he had the means and the power, the resources to save himself. And that's, folks, you, you know, while we, we can sit here and talk about Jesus, and we can talk about a situation as far as we're concerned 2,000 years ago, you put yourself in your situations and if you have the resources, if you have the means to save yourself, most of the time we'll do it. We will use it. And I understand that, you know. I mean, God had to put me in a really horrible situation to show some stuff come up out of me. And I just went, oh, my God, I hate this. This is everything I have stood against. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, because those things do show the wisdom of this age if we haven't yet replaced it. And, you know, let, I mean, let's just be real. We think we've replaced it because we've saturated in the teaching about it. But, boy, when that push came to shove in my situation, oh, my God, I'm just ashamed of the hilt. Many, you know, years ago, I just tried to cover myself. And I had enough sense that after I had said some things and done that, that when I got along with God, I said, Lord, Father, you just got to help me. I just can't, 
never would have believed I would have resorted to sin. And I said, I ask you to, to cover me. And he said, he said, Randy, I will not cover up for you, but I will cover you. <laughs> and I will tell you, he fathered me at that time. There was a release that I just can't tell you, the glory of which I clearly none of us deserve. But you don't, those are just words until you don't deserve it. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, it's just glorious. And I don't want to just talk about my situation, but I'm talking about him, me the wretch, and him not me anything. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, so this signifies that the Lord had the means and the power to keep himself from suffering and from harm. But why did he not use it? Why? Why would God not use it? <clears throat> and then I wrote, much of mankind would be willing to save others knowing there would be no cost to themselves. For example, somebody drowning and you can reach over and, you know, I'll save you. But if there's no cost, and I just wrote, hand wrote in here, um, or if whatever cost to them would be looked upon as a, with admiration, I'm willing to lose some things. I'm willing for there to be some cost as long as there's admiration for the act. <laughs> which is just us it's just selfish it is it's just you know we're, we're seeking the admiration that's why we moved that was the motive that's what moved our heart and, and we all can identify with this stuff you know and we all are this stuff unless God intervenes in a life changing way a life exchanging way that's the only way I know how to put it <clears throat> He did not use his power because his gain, Jesus, talking about Jesus, when they're going to take him and kill him, I could, he says, I, you know, he's in the garden, I could, I could call 10,000 angels, but he did not use this power because his gain would end up with great cost to fallen mankind. If he didn't die and go to the cross, everybody else would go to hell. Does that make sense? I mean, it would be horrible loss to all mankind because I saved myself if, if that was Jesus. And he, he couldn't do that. Whatever horrors, and they were horrors, whatever horrors waited for him, he accepted it because of others, for others, not for himself. <clears throat> um, let me read the whole, okay, yeah. But to follow this course of action with no explanation to your executors means that you will appear, meaning if you've got resources and you don't use them to save yourself, then if you follow that course of action and don't explain to people that I have resources, I could get out of this. Are y'all following this? Does this sort of make sense? That you, you know, you're, it's like, you know, Dude, I've got a gun and I can shoot you dead. You know, that's a resource. Right? Now, you know, you didn't catch a guy unarmed. But before he gets close enough, you pitch it in the lake and you go, take me. And you don't try to explain that you're innocent or that you're whatever. So, so that's what I mean. My wording wasn't that good here. But to follow this course of action with no explanation to your executors mean that you will appear as one who has no means of deliverance. Your appearance to them is that of weakness and helplessness and vulnerable to abuse. And let me tell you, the, what is it, the Darwin's thing, you know, the survival of the fittest. The strong survive, and the strong love picking on the weak. <clears throat> okay? 
The Lord had walked in total, and okay, here's the change up. Here's where we begin to see where the true weakness of God showed up in what we've just talked about. We're going to now describe him in his walk and in his ministry. The Lord had walked in total victory over the enemy before the cross, displaying great, great acts of power in deliverance and healing and release for others, didn't he? Just a mighty, mighty man. Yet, at the cross, he was given over to the enemy. Remember the one he was casting out of people? Now he's given over to the enemy in a most cruel way. He stood before his accusers as one who had no power, as one who was too weak to defend himself or to save himself. Yet, When he stood for others during his ministry, his power seemed limitless. As long as it involved others, he would use that power. But when it came to himself, he used the weakness of God, the wisdom of God, because none none knew. Just him and the Father and the Holy Spirit. None knew. What's the point? (laughs) What's the point of even trying to explain Yet when he stood for others during his ministry, his power seemed limitless. In accepting weakness, in accepting weakness in terms of death to himself, he opened the door for others to be redeemed from Satan's power. He literally, I mean, it was the hour and power of darkness, was it not? Think of that. That was in relationship to him, and yet by that, He opened the door to redeem others from Satan's power. He was crucified through weakness. Yes, sir. Um, I was reading something on the French philosopher Nietzsche, because he had adopted um, Darwin's uh, theory. He actually changed on some things later. The way he interpreted Darwin's theory was um, that survival fitness was not just a statement of fact, but it was a right. That those who were stronger had the right to lord over those that were weaker. Yeah. And so that's why Nietzsche hated Christianity so much, because the weak were drawn to and it just that's why he just he had court Jesus. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense if you look at it. To the eyes of the Lord, it makes sense that that's why they wanted to kill Jesus. Mm-hmm. They want to kill, and why the enemy wants to go out to the sea and mm-hmm. kill that. Mm-hmm. And in us. Right. Absolutely. <clears throat> Amen. All right. So he was crucified through weakness, but by becoming a lamb slain, more was accomplished than by all the demonstrations of miracles, power, and healing. In that weakness of God, because it's the weakness of God. But I'm sorry, folks. Maybe we need to be (laughs) shooken, shaken, and awakened to it's not just weakness. It's the weakness of God. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. But we don't see it like that. We just see it as weakness. So we don't, we we, want to avoid. Christ and him crucified. We want to avoid that. And I again, I encourage you to avoid it. Unless God draws you. Unless God unless God draws you. Yes, sir. Oh, you know, I just think as you're saying that the most miracles, most of the, the type of miracles that people focus on are things that actually strengthen the flesh. You know, healing and deliverance mm-hmm. and Well, and of course, just to make it plain, though, I mean, I don't have to do this because there's, you know, <clears throat> we're not against miracles, we're not against healings, we're not against deliverances, we believe in it, we see it happen around here all the time, but we, this knuckle-headed group of people believe that there is a power in Christ crucified. 
We believe that it's an incredible power beyond all of those supernatural things. And that it's not temporal and you can't, you know, ultimately turn the tide of it. But there has to be, you know, there is no reigning unless there's suffering. There is no true gain unless there's loss. You have to embrace the package and, and trust the Lord. But you'll never trust the Lord with the wisdom of this age. You can. It's, it, it fights against it the whole way. And it has good reasoning for it. Because it's, that's a way of thinking. Only with the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Who thought it not something to be grasped after for his advantage to be equal with God. But repudiated that, renounced it as it were. <clears throat> All right. Uh, this path was not just the path of the cross, but the path of Christ crucified. How many of you think you know what I mean when I make this difference between the, the cross and Christ crucified? Just slip your hand in. I can kind of go just barely <laughs> need, a, need a bit. But what, I, what I'm trying to say, and, I, and, you know, with complete lack of full clarity to everything, that the cross most of the time applies to the death of the old man, or the death, of, we, we talked about this last class, and I gave you scriptures that show that he defeated all of these things. You know, law and sin, the old man, the world, the, you know, all of those things, and that we have scriptures to prove it through what? The cross. But Christ crucified is the way, you're going to hate the way I'm going to say this, is the way of eternal life. It is the way that will not fade. Now abideth. Only three things. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest. The greatest of these. <clears throat> All right. I don't want to. Let's see. All right. So let's go to um, Matthew chapter 4. And I'm using this example, but there are, there's a better example, and I'll just say it when we get to it. But we'll go to <clears throat> Matthew 4, 1. <clears throat> then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. What? Lead us not into temptation. We can find our own way. <laughs> Don't need no guides for that. And yet, and yet, this is the Holy Spirit led him up in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. <clears throat> okay. The reason why I sometimes point these things out because they get pointed out to me and, they, and certain things challenge my view of God and they challenge it in a good way because it it's the Holy Spirit wanting me to expand beyond my penny any pitiful present knowledge and view that I have of the Lord so that it might become more so that I might see him in greater measure and honor him therefore as he is instead of as I perceive him to be um, and four two and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards hungry. Well, I could, I could believe that. He hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. I, afterwards, I, he was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <clears throat> And it goes on. I was going to read all the way to verse 11, but I want to try to 
get a certain section done here. Um, so I'm just going to read this. We know that long before the cross, well, oh, the, the example I wanted to give, though, was actually Jesus on the cross. And Jesus on the cross, I mean, this is one of the, you know, have you ever heard anybody talk about the utterances from the cross? Okay. Well, you would assume they must be good. Here's Jesus hanging on the cross. And here's a powerful utterance. I thirst. I thirst. Folks, he could have had angels bring him something to drink. He could have had the earth rip. You remember there was an earthquake? Well, it didn't rip open where the cross fell down and he got off of it. And, you know, and, <clears throat> or, or, you know, I mean, for that matter, you know, Moses struck a rock and a fountain came up. You know, God could have had that earthquake and a fountain come up while he's on the cross. and <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm just telling you, there are, you know... Uh, he didn't do anything to satisfy himself. So I wrote, we know that long before the cross, when the multitudes were hungry, Jesus used miraculous power to feed them. Amen? He used miraculous power to feed 5,000 people. <clears throat> However, when he was in the wilderness tempted or on the cross, he would not feed himself by turning stones to bread. He wouldn't feed himself. He had the power to, but he wouldn't do it. The power he had with which to feed others was the power of the nature of the Godhead. The power that won't put self first, would put others first. <clears throat> this is the way they operate. The Father sends the Son. The Son won't declare himself. He declares the Father. Jesus goes back, sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit won't declare himself. He declares the Son. It's the way they operate. But that same power is not, for, it's not there. It doesn't exist for self. And God knows that. I mean, I know that's contrary to modern-day Christianity. But God knows that and will not violate God just to satisfy his thirst. <clears throat> and if it was, it would not be availed upon by one with the nature of the Godhead. All right. It is in these sorts of acts that the Godhead is seen for what it is. This is the divine nature, to actually not use your power to save self because of the, because of the loss to others is in itself a manifestation of the divine nature. To actually not... Use your power to save yourself, but go to the cross and die so that others will be saved is a manifestation of the divine nature. The hour and power of darkness is only experienced by those who exercise their right not to exercise their power for personal deliverance to the loss of those who would suffer if you did use that power. Is that, you know, the hour and power of darkness is reserved for those who will embrace the wisdom of weakness. They're the only ones who go through that. But for Jesus, he, you know, well, I don't want to say too much here. <clears throat> um, this is the weakness of God. <clears throat> All right, let's, uh, let's go back to Mark. And I want to look at a quick scripture in chapter 12. <clears throat> I think I'm making pretty good time, but just to ask, how much time have I got? Okay, <clears throat> we're doing pretty good then. I might even get done early, who knows. Mark chapter 12 <clears throat> and verse 41. This is the story of the widow's might. Jesus sat opposite the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. But there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which, it, uh, which makes a farthing. I've always wondered how you made a farthing. Oh, sorry. And he called unto him his disciples, and he saith unto them, 
Verily I say unto you, this poor woman hath cast more in than all they who have cast into the treasury. I mean, can you imagine hearing those words right there and stopping and thinking about it? you got to be kidding me. They, she, she, you know, let's just say a, a farthing is five cents, ten cents. <laughs> Jesus, are you an idiot? Wisdom of this age working in their head. Are you an idiot? She put in a nickel. That guy over there put in $5,000. Jesus is just going, you don't get it. Verse 44, for all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want, or can we say she of her emptiness, did cast in all that she had, even all her living. <clears throat> all right. So why, did Je why was Jesus so taken with the widow's mind? Because she was called upon to give out of her emptiness, even as Jesus' greatest act of giving was at his most empty moment. He gave not out of the fullness of power that was his, but he emptied himself and gave what he had of weakness. <clears throat> All right. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 now. And I really think I actually will finish this. Tonight, and then guess what will happen next week? Pass number four. But it's going to be good. It's going to be different than the, the first three passes, so I think you'll enjoy it. All right, um, verse 26 through the first half of 30. Um, <clears throat> For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to nothing things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, meaning the strength of the flesh, the ability of the flesh, the wisdom of the flesh, the use of the flesh, the, the, whatever, whatever powers, whatever superpowers you were given, I'm going to say it like that, whatever superpowers you were given to get your way, they're powers of the flesh. Okay? We got Chris and Kim here. Chris can, he doesn't, but he could walk up. He's big, tall. I could walk up intimidating. He could wear leather more and stuff, you know, and maybe have him a, you know, a mohawk, you know, like Josiah or something, and, and come up and say, uh, uh, I want that parking place. And they go, oh, okay, you know. And Kim could, or, you know, it could be a, Nice looking single guy, and Kim could go, you know, and Chris go, sick him. She goes, Oh, could I please park here? I've got, I need to get into the store. I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and through that, those are different, they look different, but they're the same thing. They're the flesh using what it has to get its way, which at the core of it is, it is, I'm going to tell you the worst horrible word I could use or words I could use to express. Even though they're different at the core, they are not Jesus. They're not, that's the most horrible thing you could say. It's just not Jesus. It's us. Well, I got, you know, I'm sorry. I got this parking place for Jesus. You know, I, there's somebody that I wanted to witness to. I saw him go in the door and I needed a place to park up close so I could catch him before they get lost in the mall. Okay. So that means the means justify the end. But nothing 
There is no justification. Justification is the same root word as righteousness or right standing. And there is no right standing with God outside of Christ crucified. There isn't. There isn't. And Mallory could probably really, are you getting into that at all in Romans? Yeah. 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 Well, it's, a, it's, just, a, it's just an incredible area. And uh, if you never get into it, let me know, because maybe I'll be able to come back and really show how, this, how that's really, really the case at a later time, you know, something. <clears throat> she shared with me the other night, Thursday night, when we were going out the door, some of the things she's been sharing, it's just the same stuff, and it's Jesus, and it's Christ crucified, it's this reality of God's wisdom, as opposed to we say the wisdom of the world, folks. You could say the wisdom of of much of the modern day church. You know, it is, could be the wisdom of this church until we're changed. So that's why it's not about how wrong anybody else is. Not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. All right. I need to quit stopping like this. <clears throat> All right, so um, we came back to 1 uh, Corinthians 1, and we said that no flesh should glory in his presence in just the first half of verse 30, but of him are you in Christ Jesus. But of him are you in union with Christ Jesus. In other words, all of this weakness and everything is coming through the union of, with Christ Jesus. Instead of the flesh that is making a way for itself. All right. Um, so I wrote down, discover the power found in weakness. I wrote that and I thought this thought and I just read it again and I thought the same thought. But it was the discover the, the, the violence inherent in the system. <clears throat> but this is different, so we won't use that. <laughs> discover the pa power found in weakness. We are meant to discover that the greatest power of God that will ever be released in our lives will only be manifested in our own absolute weakness and that being due to our union with Christ crucified. Okay. All right. Do, do we need to have the greatest power of God found in weakness? No, I don't guess you have to. Let's say have to. Yeah, I don't guess you have to. You can cast demons out and you can do all this stuff and that's of God. It's not God himself. The cross, Christ crucified is God's life in the power and wisdom of serving others to its own hurt. That other is great. It's miracles and it's help. It does help. I don't know how permanent it is. I say that because I've seen many a person healed. God literally using me. Lay a hands on them. They get healed and see that once they got what they wanted, they quit following God or, quit, or didn't, you know. I've seen people get deliverance, incredible deliverances. I mean, a warlock. We were praying over and got cast out you know, legions of demons and stuff. And the deliverance, I'd free, uh, the hair would stand up on the back of your head if I described it, and yet that guy is worse today than he was then, okay? So it makes a person like me, and maybe not everyone else, and everyone isn't supposed to be like me, but it makes a person like me go, I would like to find a more permanent cure. <laughs> you know? Because it's not me showing off the, you know, well, I, I operate in, you know, seven of the nine gifts of the Spirit. What do you think of that? Aren't I special? You know, of course, I see some of you looking at me and going, well, there's two more, you know. <laughs> uh, Carol, did you have your hand up? Or was it? Oh, yes. Well, I was just thinking that living by Christ crucified is his resurrection in us. It is. It is. I mean, I don't know if that, I mean, that sounds like everything else that we say sometimes, but to me, it's like there's, there's a different angle. It's like instead of it being a resurrection for me to have life, mm 
Right. The resurrection is that I have his life, sure. right. and therefore he is experiencing resurrection. It's for him to have, to have freedom to live his way in his body. And, and you know what? That really is the true right. meaning of Galatians 2.20. It really is. Praise God. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, so Paul brings, you know, Paul begins in verse 26 with consider your calling as that of being an example of the way of the cross. Verse 27 sets forth these words, but God chose. Notice that the ones who are called are strictly done so based on God's choosing. God's choosing. Okay? <clears throat> what I'm not implying is that these scriptures are speaking of predestination, but that God makes choices based on innate preferences within his being, that which humbles itself, that which lowers itself. Jesus, who was in the form of God, lowered himself. Okay? <clears throat> this is this spirit of self-giving, lowering himself, not caring about his reputation or how he appeared, as long as that lowering and death would benefit others, God prefers that. <laughs> that's the only way I know how to put it. I know my wording, but that's a, if you could see that such action is a preference innate in God. Now, we know that the only way humans will do that is by Christ crucified, by Christ in you, Amen. So he prefers Christ, but we could, we could define Christ as anything, you know. Christ is being rich. Christ is being successful. But, you know, for me to be following Christ is my success proves it. Anyway, I, you know, I don't want to say too much about it, but I'm saying that that spirit of Jesus will give up its success, will give up it. Folks, he didn't, Jesus didn't give up his, just give up his success. He gave up as it were, and you understand what I mean, I'm not, but he gave up Godhood. Come on. Out of love? For enemies? I don't even want to talk about it. Because I, you know, I don't know that I understand it. How can I expect you to fully understand it? Maybe you understand it way, way more than I do. But I, it's just too high for me. And even though it's the same words, we say, you know, that's what Jennifer's trying to point out. I just don't want to say the same words so that we all understand the same thing. I feel that this is saying, you know, something here. <clears throat> so he chooses what is, and, and I'm trying to just communicate I'm going to use words that I'm just trying to communicate <clears throat> a predetermined innate character trait in God. It's not theology. It's just me trying to help you to see that there's God. When he leans, he leans a certain way, okay? Because <clears throat> I know this isn't theologically the best way to say it and may not even be fully theologically sound. That's why I must tell you, don't listen to what I tell you. I tell you. Don't listen to what I told you, which was to tell you don't listen to me. Which means listen to what I... <laughs> you see, this is moving into insanity. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. He, he chooses, let's see. <clears throat> In these scriptures, we see again how weakness is pressed to the front of God's preferences. <clears throat> he chooses what is weak every time. However, this is not brought about, <clears throat> about simply because <clears throat> of an act of choosing, but he chooses based on this principle of strength out of weakness, life out of death, gain out of loss. This means that his choice is also in opposition to the strong because they exalt themselves. <clears throat> Are you following? Not perfect theology. Just trying to get, see that there's a bent within God. <clears throat> 
That means that his choice is also in opposition to the strong. That which is, impresses God is born out of all who embrace the common factor, Christ crucified. There at the cross, we see the emblem of suffering and shame, the standard and banner that cries forth the truth that God brings power out of the rejected and despised when it acknowledges his cross way of faith. <coughs> <coughs> All right, we're going to finish this. Proof that there is a God. <laughs> At the cross, la um, <clears throat> I'll make this the last paragraph. At the cross, we discover the basis upon which God functions. Can you see it? Can you look at the cross and see more than your own salvation or the benefits to you? Can you look at the cross and discover the basis upon which God functions? For Christians today, it is similar to the task concerning the tabernacle. Moses was to see to it that he made all things down here in accord with the pattern he saw in the mount. Was, all that was shadow stuff. The mount, folks, is Mount Calvary. It's the only mount that God really ultimately cares about. Moriah was holy only because it represented that. <clears throat> in like manner, once the pattern was reenacted here on earth, meaning I'm, I'm comparing two things now. <clears throat> I'm comparing Moses seeing the pattern on the mount where he was at, <clears throat> And I'm seeing us and, and, and him seeing that pattern and then coming down and reenacting what he saw there down here. Does that make sense? Moses did that. Remember, he, he saw the pattern there. He saw all that and he built something in the earth that was godlike, if you will, the tabernacle. I'm also likening that to us seeing by the Holy Spirit the pattern of Christ crucified in the mount at the cross, seeing more than a benefit, seeing a pattern of God and a pattern meant to be reenacted in my life into this earth. Okay, I know all this is not all the best way to say it. <clears throat> so... Um, so in like manner, once the pattern was reenacted here on earth, God himself came down and filled it, talking about the Moses' tabernacle. Once, once that thing, that heavenly vision, was, was more than a heavenly vision, it became a practical reality for people who are working to build that in the earth. God came down and filled it. God came down and filled it. <clears throat> and we see in that same thing that God will do that with us. <clears throat> For us, that is no shadow. For us, once the pattern of Christ crucified is laid in us, Jesus himself will perform the life and death of it. So if that's true, and, and honestly, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I should be, but I'm not here as a great teacher or even a teacher. I'm not here as a pastor. I, I, if I was, I would be more responsible to you. I'm here as one yet learning, and I'm just saying that if this is true, <clears throat> then we have hope by even our open-hearted pursuit of Christ crucified, of seeing it in the mount. We have hope because if we also desire that to be reenacted in the earth, Mr. Shekinah glory himself will come down and fill that and make it true reality because he'll do the living, he'll do the dying, he'll fulfill all the law of the covenants by life. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you.
that as we just um, we gather at your feet, Father, I admit my total lack and my inability to verbalize or to give a truly uh, accurate uh, order and theological uh, wording that is precise. I pray that you will uh, that you will see my weakness and my lack and that you will fill these who hunger for you with the life of it so that Lord if you do that you fill them with the life of it there will be nobody that can glory in that but we will glory in the Lord not in me not in my teaching we will glory in the Lord your son because we will know it really only came by him and so, Father, I, I ask you to bless your people, help them open their hearts and open their eyes strictly to you. And, Lord, I pray your blessing to, to cover them from any wrong perceptions or ways of presenting that I might have done tonight or any other time. I ask only that you gather them to you and that you be their pastor and you be their teacher, Jesus. Protect them from the evil one and protect them from spirits and attitudes that might be contrary. Not, not to what I taught, but contrary to what is you, of what you see to be contrary. And Lord, release something of eternal life in such a manner that all the days of their life they'll be protected, they'll be fed, they'll be loved, they'll be taken care of and brought forward in you. Thank you for them. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed. One more pass, brothers and sisters, and then we're going to actually start.